This video is all about the structure of flowering plants. We're particularly concerned with the internal structure of the stem and also the internal structure of the root. So we know that a flowering plant is made up of a shoot system above the soil and a root system below the soil. The main part of the shoot is the stem. You can have a woody stem that contains wood or a herbaceous stem which does not contain wood. At the top of the plant is the terminal bud, sometimes referred to as the apical bud. Plants generally grow by getting taller and longer, so the root tips are growing and the shoot tips are growing, and the reason for that is because of the presence of apical meristems. Meristems are plant tissue capable of producing new cells by mitosis, and the cells that they produce can become any type of plant cell. So Mary stems are found at root tips and shoot tips, but they're also found in the lateral or the axillary buds. These are the buds that are growing along the stem, just above where the leaf attaches. Often these are dormant. The Mary stems are inhibited from working or undergoing mitosis due to apical dominance. So this is when the terminal bud or the apical bud produces growth regulators, chemicals that are basically inhibiting the meristematic tissue from undergoing mitosis. Remove that apical bud and you remove apical dominance and it results in a low bushy plant. Some other labels that you need to know would be the node, which is the point at which the leaf is attached to the stem, the internode, which is the space between two nodes, the petiole, which is the stalk of the leaf, the axle, which is the angle created between the leaf and the stem. So let's take a look at the woody stem and see if we can recognise some key features. Well, first of all, at the very top, we notice the apical bud. Then we notice these particular markings or scars called girdle scars or scale scars. They wrap around the circumference of the stem at fixed positions. And these scars mark the previous position of where there once was an apical bud. And if you count the spaces between the scale scars, it marks for one year's growth. So on an exam paper, if you got a picture like this, you can see three years growth. Another type of scar left on a woody stem is a leaf scar. This is the scar that's left when a leaf falls or is detached from the stem. And you can see the petiole in the picture here attaching the leaf. When the petiole is removed or falls away from the stem, it's going to leave a leaf scar. So just above the leaf scar there, you can see the axillary or the lateral bud. This is the bud that will give rise to new branches. And remember that there is meristematic tissue in the axillary or lateral buds. Another feature on the woody stem are lenticles. These are openings for gas exchange. Two gases that leave the plant through the lenticles are carbon dioxide and water vapour and one gas that enters is oxygen and that was previously asked. It's really important that you can list four functions of the stem. So number one, to support the aerial parts of the plant. Number two, transport material, upwards from the roots and downwards from the leaves. Number three is photosynthesis and number four is food storage. So let's look at the structure of the leaf and remember the leaf is another organ, it's an organ of the plant. So the leaf is a thin flat lamina, that's a really important detail. The fact that it's thin allows for the rapid diffusion of gases into and out of the leaf for photosynthesis and the fact that it's broad and flat means that it's really well suited or adapted to absorbing all of that sunlight to maximise photosynthesis. The leaf is usually attached to the stem of a plant by means of a stalk called the petiole. So the petiole is a part of the leaf that contains important vascular tissue, xylem and phloem. That's really important for transporting water into the leaf from the stem and transporting food made in the leaf down to the other parts of the plant. Down through the middle of the leaf is the venation and it's leading in directly from the petiole. The venation contains that vascular tissue and from that main vein in the leaf on the left you can see that it emerges into smaller veins. Venation can be in two patterns, it depends on the type of the plant. It can either be netted or reticulate or it could be parallel. The functions of the leaf are number one, to make food in the process known as photosynthesis, number two, to store food, number three, gas exchange, and number four, transpiration, which is the loss of water vapour from the undersurface of the leaf. So as this chapter is about plant structure, we have to discuss the plant tissues, the tissues which make up the plant. So there are three types of tissue in question. The first is dermal tissue, then there's ground tissue, and then there's vascular tissue. And it's really important that you can give a function of each of these three tissue types. Dermal tissue is for protection. Ground tissue makes up the bulk of the plant. Storage, support and photosynthesis are three of the functions of ground tissue. Vascular tissue is for transport. There's two types. Xylem transports water and minerals upwards through the plant and phloem transports food downwards. Flowering plants are grouped into two groups, monocots and dicots. 
monocots are so called because they have one seed leaf. They have one cotyledon in the seed. But in your exams, you state a monocot has one seed leaf. A seed leaf is there for food storage. Dicots have two seed leaves. So they have two seed leaves and they're there for food storage. So let's look at some other features of monocots. They generally have parallel venation. Their flower parts are in threes or multiples of threes. And let's look at the stem to see what the stem looks like internally. This diagram is a transverse section or a cross section of a monocot stem. It's really important that we always mark in the three types of tissue. Dermal tissue is always on the outside. Ground tissue makes up the bulk of the stem and vascular tissue in a stem is arranged in vascular bundles. So you have the xylem and the phloem, but they're arranged in these bundles. The key feature of a monocot stem is the arrangement of those bundles. There is no fixed pattern. There is no fixed arrangement. They are scattered throughout the stem. Really important. So let's compare dicots to monocots. Well, dicots, the venation in the leaves is netted or reticulate. The flower parts are in fours or fives or multiples of these. And most importantly, when we look at a cross section of the stem, we see that the vascular bundles are in a fixed arrangement around the edge. So here we have our transverse section or a cross section of the dicot stem. We have our dermal tissue, our ground tissue and our vascular tissue, three very important labels. We know this is a stem because there are vascular bundles. The vascular tissue is arranged in bundles and we know that this is a dicot stem because those vascular bundles are arranged in a fixed pattern around the edge, not like monocots. One question we encountered on an ordinary level paper was that you were given a photograph of a dicot stem and you were asked to label which was xylem and which was phloem. Xylem is always the part of the vascular bundle that's nearest to the centre and phloem is the part of the vascular bundle that's nearest to the edge. So we looked at the transverse section of the dicot stem. Let's compare that to the dicot root. So how do you know that this is a root and not a stem? Well, it's the arrangement of the vascular tissue. In the stem, it's arranged as bundles, vascular bundles. But in the root, there are no vascular bundles. The xylem is like this star-like structure at the centre and the phloem is in between. And remember, if you're asked to draw the dicot root, always mark in the dermal, the ground and the vascular tissue. So let's take a closer look at roots. There are two possible root systems that a plant can have, the first of which is called a fibrous root system, generally associated with monocots, and grass is a great example. With a fibrous root system, the roots are formed from the stems, and this results in many small roots of similar size that don't penetrate the soil deeply. So the next type of root system is the taproot, the taproot forms from the radical in the seed and this type of root is associated with dicots. You can see an example of the dandelion here or the carrot and it's generally just a large main root with many side smaller lateral roots. So the next diagram of the root is the longitudinal section of the root, a really important diagram where you have to mark in the four root zones. The first is the zone of protection. This is where there's a root cap protecting the root as it burrows or grows down into the soil. The next zone is the zone of cell production, so called because of the presence of that apical meristem. You know that a meristem is plant tissue capable of producing new cells by means of mitosis. So new cells are produced in this zone. And once those new cells are produced, they are entering into the zone of elongation, where those newly produced cells simply get longer. The final zone is the zone of differentiation, where those newly produced elongated cells will turn into dermal ground or vascular tissue. So next we have to go into the detailed structure of xylem. Xylem is a type of vascular tissue. It transports water and dissolved minerals. There are two forms, xylem tracheids and xylem vessels. Xylem tracheids are long hollow tubes with pointed or tapered ends. They have holes in them called pits where the water can pass, the water can go sideways or upwards, and they overlap with other tracheids. The thing to remember about tracheids is that they have an end wall and they're narrow, so bear that in mind. So when we look at the other type of xylem, xylem vessels, we immediately see that it's wider, much wider than the tracheids, and it forms long, hollow, continuous tubes with no end walls. So vessels are wider than tracheids, they have no end walls, and so they're much more efficient at transporting water than the tracheids. 
This diagram shows the longitudinal section of a xylem vessel, but it's showing important key features. It's showing that there's a hollow lumen, so a hollow space through which the water and dissolved minerals flow. It's showing that there's holes in the cell walls called pits through which the water can flow or pass sideways if it needs to. It is also showing you that xylem has very thick cell walls, and those walls are further made stronger or supported by the presence of this substance called lignin. And lignin is laid down in particular patterns, spiral being one. It's the presence of lignin that makes xylem so strong and prevents it from inwardly collapsing. So just to clarify that xylem is classed as dead and the reason for that is because the living contents of those cells, the tracheids and the vessel members have died at maturity so they're no longer alive at maturity. The vessels are those long hollow continuous tubes but they are made up of individual vessel members whose cell contents have died at maturity and they've stacked on top of each other to form one long hollow continuous tube. Lignin is the key to the strength of xylem and it's laid down in particular patterns within the cell wall. So finally, we have to discuss phloem, the vascular tissue that transports food downwards through the plant. It's made up of sieve tube elements stacked on top of each other to form sieve tubes and connected with each sieve tube element is a companion cell and for this reason phloem is said to be living tissue. So phloem is essentially made up of these long continuous tubes called sieve tubes which do not contain lignin. Each individual sieve tube is made up of these units called sieve tube elements that have an associated companion cell. There is cytoplasm but it's pushed to the side in each of those sieve tube elements and the base of every one of them has a sieve plate which has perforations or holes through which the sugar can pass from one element to the next. All the diagrams of phloem we've looked at so far have been longitudinal sections. This is a transverse section, chopping across the top and looking in. So this is a terrible diagram to get and it's usually answered pretty badly or it's presented pretty badly in exam papers. Make sure you look for sieve plates with the holes in them. Make sure you look for the companion cell with the nucleus and make sure you can identify the associated sieve tube element. So finally, on this whole chapter, let's just go over the functions of the root. So number one is anchorage, number two is to absorb water and minerals, number three, transport, and number four, storage. Finally, this longitudinal diagram of the root is really important. Can you mark in all of the tissue types and specific labels? So can you mark in dermal tissue, grand tissue, the vascular tissue made up of the xylem and the phloem? So you can see the xylem at the centre and the phloem surrounding it. And can you mark in the root hairs? So really important you might be asked to draw or to label this. So that was plant structure. Very important chapter with really important diagrams. Please do the exam questions and check the official marking scheme. The details that require and the answers are so particular you need to practice them. Remember these videos don't replace using your textbook. They're not made for monetary gain and they're not intended for commercial use. Best of luck.